Good morning. Grace and peace be to you from God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you to this online worship service for First Presbyterian Church here in Pilot Mountain, North Carolina. A couple of announcements that need to be made for this morning. We do appreciate all of the contributions that have been mailed in for the church that keep, help keep us running. But we also need to uh, announce that today is the fourth Sunday. Normally on the fourth Sunday we have our two cents a meal contributions. We do uh, need to help our community and this is one of those contributions that does help a lot of people in our community um, to be able to get food that they need. And if you are able to send in those contributions with your contributions normal to Dickey or to the church, it would be greatly appreciated. A second announcement is, Drive-In Church is coming. We are in the uh, process of purchasing an FM transmitter to be able to conduct our worship services at the church while you are seated in your car. Uh, we're looking forward to doing that hopefully on August 2nd, which is Communion Sunday. And more information will be coming in the uh, email next week. So be on the lookout for that, and we hope to see you soon. If you would join me now in our call to worship that is printed in the bulletin. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him. Sing praises to Him. Tell of all His wonderful works. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. Remember the wonderful works He has done, His miracles and the judgments He has uttered. O offspring of His servant Abraham, children of Jacob, His chosen ones. Scripture tells us if we say we have no sin, then we are found to be lying and God is not with us. So let us take this time to confess our sins to both God and to each other in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of mystery, God of life, we imagine that we are capable judges of power and wisdom and goodness. We trust our own standards. We separate and categorize. We mark the performance of others. We fail to trust your power hidden in all things. We fail to watch for you, working out your purposes. Gracious God, hidden and manifest, transform our withered imaginations until we yield the judgments we trust to a love we cannot control. Amen. Brothers and sisters, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Sisters and brothers, nothing we have done, nothing we will ever do is enough to separate us from the love of God made known in Jesus Christ. Hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And if you would join me now for our unison prayer for illumination. Spirit of life, we do not know how to pray as we ought. Meet us in words written, in words spoken. Intercede for us with sighs too deep for words until we shine with the hope that is hidden in our hearts. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 105, verses 1 through 11 and 45b. And listen now to the word of the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on His name, make known His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him, sing praises to Him, tell of all His wonderful works. Glory in His holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and His strength, seek His presence continually. Remember the wonderful works He has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered, O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He is mindful of his covenant forever. 
of the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for, your, for an inheritance. Praise the Lord. And from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And our second reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 29, verses 15 through 28. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go in to her. For my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went in to her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, this is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other, also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have been following Jacob the past few weeks from his wrangling of the birthright from Esau through his travels through the wilderness to his uncle in the city of Haran. When he arrives there, he meets his cousin Rachel and his uncle Laban, whom we first met when we met Rebekah. When he comes to the home of Laban, Jacob is destitute. He has no money, 
no servants, no camels, nothing but his staff, his clothes, and the sandals on his feet. Now I'm sure his uncle, after seeing the gifts that had been brought when his sister was taken to marry Isaac, was disappointed by this lack of wealth. But he takes the young man in, and Jacob begins to work for him. When asked what his wages will be, Jacob claims that he wants Rachel as his wife because he loves her. Without the money to pay the bride price, he agrees to work for seven years for her, and those days seem to fly by because of his love. And when the time is over, Jacob has to remind Laban about their deal. Laban, who appears to be as crafty, if not more so, as Jacob, agrees that there was a deal, and he throws a wedding feast that really amounts to a large drinking party. Finally, the bride is brought out, and she is veiled as custom would dictate. Jacob and his wife retire to another room and spend the night with one another. But lo and behold, the next morning, Jacob, probably with a terrific hangover, discovers that his new wife is not his beloved Rachel, but her older sister Leah. Jacob is incensed and demands an explanation. This is what he says beginning in verse 25. What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, And this is not done in our country, giving the younger daughter before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other, in return for serving me another seven years. The deceiver had been deceived. Notice, though, that Jacob does not argue with Laban about the price for Rachel. He knows that he has been had, and this is the only way to have his beloved. And so he goes to work again with a father-in-law who knows he's gotten a pretty good deal. Two daughters off his hands, free labor for 14 years from a son-in-law. Jacob is silent for his part, and we don't hear much from him in the next chapter. Now, I reviewed this story to illustrate what's going on in the text today. But what I really wanted to talk about is the two sisters, Leah and Rachel. Here's a sibling rivalry that will continue not between nations, but between tribes of a single nation, the nation of Israel. Now, in chapter 30, we find the sibling rivalry between the two sisters at full height. Now, going back to chapter 29, Leah is said to have lovely eyes. Now, some translations have her with weak eyes, but the Hebrew says tender eyes. So it is difficult to know what is meant here. Could she have lovely eyes and a great personality? Or could her eyes be some way deficient? Whatever it was, she could not hold a candle to the lovely and gorgeous Rachel. One can already see sibling rivalry occurring here. And then there's the case of Jacob and how he treats his wives. The text says he loved Rachel more than Leah. One sees how this also could lead to a sibling rivalry. The one who is neglected tries in many ways to get the attention of the husband, while the one who is loved gets all the attention. And this will play out later in Jacob's sons, particularly the ones born to Rachel herself. So the rivalry is set, and has probably been, been going on for years. Rachel was probably and surely pursued by suitors while Leah could only watch. And then Leah gets the husband before Rachel. Most likely she knew of the deception, but did not say anything because, like most women in the ancient Near East, she was considered the property of her father, and later her husband, who does not really want her. And God, seeing that she was neglected, gave her the one way that women could achieve status in that society. Children, specifically sons. Now, Leah has four sons by the end of chapter 29, each one named specifically to A, get the attention she craves from her husband, and B, to rub her pretty sister's nose in the fact that she has sons while Rachel is barren. Rachel is bitter at all of this and appeals to Jacob who rebuffs her by saying he can do nothing about her barrenness. Rachel, in the tradition of the family of Abraham, takes matters into her own hands. She gives Jacob her maid to bear sons for her to adopt as her own. Not to be outdone, Leah does the same thing. There is more give and take between the two sisters before finally, Rachel has her own son who is named Joseph. And this son will be 
rather important later on in the story. The rivalry between the two sisters makes the rivalry between Jacob and Esau look tame. Both sisters are willing to do anything to get what they want, including the selling of the right to spend the night with Jacob. But in the story, they also can come together. When Jacob tells them that God has told him that it's time to leave, they both state this about their father. Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us and has been using up the money given for us. All the property that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, do whatever God has said to you. And so they leave, never looking back at the home or the father who sold them without any input from them about how they felt about Jacob. No, they show in their rivalry that they are on their own and that they are their own women who can hold their own against the men in their lives and against each other. The sisters' rivalry is a lesson for the church today. There are often cliques that do not welcome those who are deemed not worthy, they, who will not sit with ones of lower status, or who will ignore people who are right there in front of them. For whatever reason, we judge others as not worthy. We do what the first verses of the second chapter of James tell us not to do. We favor the one over the other. And so, those who are on the outside looking in, fight amongst each other to get the advantage and maybe the favor of those on the inside. They may have all things going for them, but like Leah, they are still neglected. And so they turn bitter and turn their backs on the church. And Jesus had a lot to say for those who were on the outside looking in. He reached out to those who were on the margins. He touched the lepers. He ate with tax collectors and sinners. He admonished those who were on the inside. He called on his disciples to reach out to the least of these and to bring them into the fold. In this sense, Jesus mirrored the treatment of God to Leah. Leah was the neglected one and had sons. One of her sons, Judah, was the one from whom King David was descended and the tribe from which Jesus came as well. As Miguel de la Torre says, the stone that was rejected was the one upon which the foundation of reconciliation was built. That the rivalry that we see around us is a consequence of our wanting to be the one who was chosen. We see others who we believe are not the right kind of person, who may have lovely eyes, but cannot compare to those who are graceful and beautiful. And so we struggle to outdo one another to get the attention of the God who has already told us that we are precious in God's sight. May we break our sibling rivalry that divides us and come together as one in the church that is united in Christ. Amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning is the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess the faith of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us turn now to the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Holy God, we do not know how to pray, but Jesus invites us into the life He shares with you, and so we keep coming, because we want to live. Receive us now in our frailty, our complacency, our desire. 
We pray for your church all over the world, that we would be seed and yeast where life has grown barren and heavy. May the life we discover in you bind us to each other and to the world you love. For no need is beyond the strength of your call, and no child of yours is expendable. Merciful God, give us wisdom and courage beyond our imagining. We pray for friends and strangers in the grip of addiction. Make us able companions for each other, and bless us with hope that bears fruit. We pray for unsettled economies and those whose needs are overlooked in the choices of the powerful. May we, who know so much privilege, bear our responsibilities with open hearts and open hands. We pray for all who stand at the thresholds of life, for those children who are soon to be born and your children who are soon to go home. We give thanks for new faces to love, ideas to ponder, work to do, and we marvel at the sturdy friendships and persistent memories that sustain us when the way is hard. May we each be a reminder of your love and your provision. Give strength to leaders who call forth the best from us and invite us to breathe together. Holy One who keeps calling us into the world, your world, as seed and yeast and treasure, equip each of us for the challenges we will face until we learn to worship in the most unlikely places. For you are the source of our song and the well from which we pray, wherever we are planted. By the power of your Spirit, we make our prayer with resurrection hope. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the charge. May you see Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see Christ in you. And hear now the blessing. May God who searches the heart, Jesus whose love overcomes all division, and the Spirit which helps us in our weakness continue to lead you into life that you may serve with abandon and joy, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>